Uh, but in some sense, the next session is really a very natural uh, a continuation of this one. Uh, as you might have gathered, I'm, I'm uh, pretty fond of, uh, of Div and I'm pretty fond of Fed, but it's worth acknowledging that uh, these funds are, uh, number one, a new kids on the block, and number two, uh, an extremely small share of uh, overall uh, ODA on the world. So uh, this would not be, this discussion would not be complete before, uh, if we didn't uh, have a conversation with uh, the, the people who make uh, the rest <laughs> of, the, of those um, uh, bilateral and multilateral organizations tick. So I'm very delighted to call, uh, I'll introduce everybody in, in together and they will sit here at the stage and I'll moderate. Um, I'll make a small uh, uh, break in protocol and not go in alphabetical order. Um, I, would, I would like to introduce Ariana Legovini. She's the director of the Development Impact Evaluation at the World Bank. Uh, it is a good opportunity to uh, remind uh, all of you of the critical role that the World Bank played uh, early in the uh, journey of making uh, impact evaluation or uh, even thinking about what impact program have and what impact even means, uh, and without whom uh, a lot of what we have described uh, these days uh, would not even be there. And in this particular, among uh, the many people who played key role at the World Bank, uh, Ariana is, you know, stands uh, as a particularly important one. Ariana uh, Legovini is the director of DIME. Uh, that's the Dev uh, Development Impact Evaluation uh, Department at the bank. It's much predates feed and div. Uh, she created the DIME model, I should say, for the French people working alongside with Francois Bourguignon, uh, who was then the chief economist of the, of the World Bank. Uh, to transform the way that data impact evaluation evidence is generated and channeled into uh, policy action. Before working on them, she established the Africa Impact Evaluation Initiative for the Africa region, which was the model for, for bank, and also developed the Africa Results uh, Monitoring System, which was the first World Bank system to monitor World Bank results. So a lot of the ferment of what we are discussing today uh, is, in, is in her work. I also would like to introduce uh, Charlotte Watts, uh, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor and Director for Research and Evidence at uh, what is now uh, known as uh, FCD, FCDO, which is the UK uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, known, previously known and fondly remembered uh, by many of us as, as DFID. Well, it's not the name we care about, <laughs> but DFID is another of these organizations that really was uh, in particular among the bilateral organizations such a pioneer in how to do things right uh, and uh, set a model for, for many other people to, to, to follow through. And Charlotte is the chief scientific advisor and director for research. She's the most senior scientist in FCDOs and she had the research and evidence uh, directorate. The, this, the directorate brings together the leadership of the uh, FCDO experts, uh, geopolitical and development advisors. Um, she oversees uh, uh, research technological de uh, development investments and with uh, the Department of uh, Science, Innovation of Technology, she jointly oversees the UK Overseas uh, Science and Innovation uh, Diplomatic Network. So in this context, uh, she's one of the key um, architect of what's happening around innovation and, and science deficit. Then I'd like to call as well uh, Dean Carlin. Uh, Dean uh, has many uh, relevant hats for this. Uh, first, as uh, some of you know, is my first uh, student ever. So if Michael introduced me to uh, RCT, I think I introduced uh, Dean. Um, he, is, uh, he became my student before, before I graduated. Uh, uh, he, uh, he also is the founder of IPA, Innovation for Poverty Action, and it's also IPA's 20th anniversary, so we are happy to congratulate them. Um, IPA is deep in the weed of the logistics of actually doing this work in most of the countries in the world. Uh, Jepal presence, physical footprint presence, uh, is, is important in some countries and limited in others, and therefore 
uh, we work in close partnership in many aspects. But the reason why Dean is here is not to represent IPA, but to, uh, because uh, he, is, uh, he was recently appointed to our great delight as the chief economist uh, for uh, USAID, uh, the United States, United States Agency for International Development in which, for example, uh, Div um, resides. Um, and then Thomas Melonio, who is the executive director of innovation strategy and research for the IFD and a close uh, friend uh, of, of, of FID, but works way beyond. He's an economist by training. And the objective of the innovation strategy and research division that he heads is to find solution to the various complex challenge of international, international development to research, knowledge sharing, innovation. Um, in 2012, he also became a deputy advisor and then an advisor to the French president on Africa. Uh, so I will call them to the table. We have uh, about a, an hour till lunch. Uh, so please welcome. Uh, all of you. I know them, so I don't think I will need to do much animation. Uh, so I will uh, try to uh, take myself out of the picture as much as possible from now on. Okay. Thank you, Esther, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, uh, being here today. I am, je suis ravi, en fait, uh, of being here with Esther, Abiji, Dean, Michael, and everyone else who has really been at the start of a movement that has transformed economic development into an empirical science. This is, it's been absolutely transformational and there has elicited so much passion and energy all over development. Uh, we have to remember what, where we started from, from a development which was really kind of based on old theories um, with very little energy and all of a sudden we have a movement that has been transforming the world. So I'm super, super excited and congratulations for this wonderful anniversary. Um, I want to say that when I first joined the bank, um, the way loans were delivered and advice was delivered was by expert, experts. And that expert advice had weak evidence base. And that really um, affected the, not only the effectiveness of our loans, but also the right of self-determinations of country to choose their own path to development. Uh, the, the transformation of science into development has allowed us to transfer power to countries to find their own solutions to their problems and also negotiate with development agencies like the World Bank and others for financing what they could prove and document worked in their context. So I think that was very exciting transformation in the way we do development. Why did I start it? Why did I go back to the World Bank to start this group? I was a little frustrated with piecemeal research, and I was frustrated by the fact that institutions like the bank, but more generally all development financed, was not being used for the purpose of learning. And I thought by starting something, a research group in the World Bank that would be devoted to impact evaluation, we would be able to leverage two things. One, a huge amount of financing for the purpose of testing and learning, and two, take advantage of a network of relationships with governments that permeated the whole developing world. And so that we would not need to make that extra effort to establish those relationships, but we could kind of ride that wave and make a contribution. I think the contribution, of course, of this whole movement is on creating very rigorous evidence that allows us to understand the mechanics of development and actually contribute not to judging whether people are doing the right thing or not, but actually supporting them in the process of getting better at what they do. Now, in, in this process, um, so the methodological contribution, of course, has been dramatic, and we have seen, of course, uh, the awards of, of 
the Nobel Prize to, to these amazing researchers. But we have done, I think, more than that, which is to create a collaborative model of production of, and generation of evidence that has built capacity and is building capacities in organizations and governments and agencies that then transforms the way they think about the development process from a predetermined model of policy design into an adaptive and iterative model of thinking about, okay, I, I, I know, I actually remember 2009, we were in Dakar with Abhijit and the, uh, Amina Tanyan, the head of the private sector agencies at that time, asked him, why are, why are professors not coming to me, giving me advice? And Abhijit says, well, we become a little more humble about what we know. And that humbleness, and that humbleness that Abhijit actually displays in every day, in every day of his life, is that the very root of our ability to learn more, just defining the fact that we don't know which, we have lots of ideas, a lot of innovations, but we don't know necessarily which ideas work in practice and that by testing them on, in the, on the ground and figuring out which ones are the great ideas that we should put forth, we can actually make a huge contribution to the path of development and increase development impact. So one of uh, a little bit my obsessions was to kind of figuring out you know, how, what was the value of that knowledge that we could generate in, uh, in such collaborative fashion. And we have heard today from, from Michael and others um, the returns that they've estimated from investments in knowledge. The, the approach that we took was to think about um, these multi-arm trials and you know, taking projects from their status quo and testing innovations and then looking at the moment of adoption and the wedge between the effectiveness of the status quo versus the innovation to calculate and understand the value of the knowledge we have been generating in our program. And the news is uh, very, very positive. What we find is that very small investments in the order of 1% of project cost, in the case of the World Bank, generate increases in impact by more than 50%. These are randomized controlled trials. The difference is a significant difference in the status quo versus the innovations that have been adopted. These are, what this says is that we, the, the amount of funding and the amount of efforts in this business is actually much smaller than it should be from an economic point of view. The returns to this work are huge. And so we are calling for an increase in knowledge financing, which is congruent with the returns to the generation of this knowledge, but also congruent with the ambitions that we have to make a larger difference in the world. That takes me to what is happening today. So I think we are still very, very small relative to where we should be. So in the bank, uh, currently there is a huge pro process of reform one that is completely transforming the operational model. The World Bank has doubled its size in, very, in a couple of years uh, with no changes in our administrative budget. So everybody's feeling very constrained and there are pressures to actually increase our size even further. And so people are innovating in the way we should be doing our business, moving away from piecemeal projects into large, multi-phase, multi-country programs. And we can use these programs. And in fact, part of the design of the new operational model is to put forth global priority programs that, have, that uh, incorporate trials as part and parcel of what they will do. These are multi-countries. So the first country entering these programs will be the subject of these early trials to to optimize the design of the interventions. But these programs can also be used to push global agendas, climate, conflict, pandemic preparedness, forestry, and the preservations of the Amazons, the 
Indonesian forests, etc. Kind of taking these global agendas to these global programs, but then incorporating very strong, iterative, randomized control trials within them, thinking strategically about what we need to learn in each area to advance much quicker on these solving development problems. But this is not just about the World Bank, and I'm going to I'm going to you know conclude by saying that. Um, the, so there, there are multiple tensions and, uh, and multiple priorities in development because of the large threats that we are facing. And so that we need to come together. One thing that I've learned in all this work from the very beginning is that leaders make a huge difference in the way we can progress. We have leaders today in the World Bank, people like Victoria Kwakwa, who's our Vice President for East and Southern Africa, or Manta Murti, who was yesterday here, the VP for Human Development. These type of leaders um, understand and push for the adoption of better science for better impact. We have a new president, Ajay Banga, who's come on board, and he's pushing very hard for change and transforming transformative change and transformative impact. And I think these type of leaders, supported adequately from all of us, can actually affect change in uh, amazing ways. We're pushing today to go beyond the bank and creating a global alliance for development impact. We have had meetings uh, with all the development agencies, agree on a new way of moving forward that combines our efforts and combines the um, generation and adoption of knowledge, scientific knowledge, into our programming. Working together, we can achieve so much more than we can in isolation. I think uh, we have worked <laughs> over, over the years. You know, everybody works and does the best they can do. Uh, but this idea of working together more cohesively to actually build a knowledge base and support countries investing their own capacities for doing trials, for building their managerial capacities to manage the development process can actually be uh, uh, quite transformational. So I'm going to leave it at that, but just to say that we have amazing results all across um, our impact evaluation programs. We can see that the effects of working, even in sectors where experiments were not considered valuable, are really, really large. And I'm, I just want to give the example of infrastructure that captures about 40 to 50% of development finance. What we find is building infrastructure only takes us half the way there. And that by thinking through trials and other ways, thinking through the whole life cycle of construction, maintenance, and usage, we can actually double the impact of infrastructure investments. Just, just, just this thought that half of our investments deliver half of what they could deliver is what uh, should, should be sufficient motivation for us to come together and change the way we do business. So thank you very much, Esther and everybody else. No, can you hear me now? Lovely. Um, really wonderful to be here. I was given a couple of questions. Shall I speak to them? Yes. Okay. Not really. Um, I'm happy to sit here if that's all right. It feels a bit closer to the audience down here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm the chief scientist at FCDO. So Rachel was my uh, counterpart. I did impact, she did costs. If you think about the sort of science so in some respects and in the discussions that we had at FCDO. Um, and so an important part of my job as chief scientist is trying to generate the evidence that we need to inform development. And for us, um, 
It, we've had a long history, both as DFID and now continued with FCDA, of really wanting to invest in generation of rigorous evidence to inform the breadth of our policy priorities. And the way we think about that is we need that evidence to inform our own decision making. In our own planning processes, we have review processes that look at, you know, are our proposals using evidence? If the evidence is weak, what does that mean about how we move forward and so on? But we also recognize the value of it as a global public good. Um, and that's something that hasn't got reflected and brought out, I think, in the discussion over the last couple of days. We've had wonderful examples of how evidence has informed the direct program where that evaluation was being conducted. But um, coming from a development agency perspective, we are really interested in generating the evidence, not only to help us try and get things right, but also that country partners can use that evidence, that the big UN agencies can use that evidence as well. So for us, that global public good, which means is part of why you get such phenomenal returns from investing in rigorous evaluation is, is why and why justify to ministers why we keep on investing in this and why we should continue to keep investing in this. Um, over the years, um, we've been thinking about in the types of investments that we do, two aspects. One is how do we generate evidence on areas where our money will make a difference or our attention will make a difference. And so I'm quite proud that we've invested in things like how do we generate evidence on how to prevent violence against women or how to achieve learning outcome for girls or what is the way to deliver uh, early childhood development, some of the examples that you've been hearing about, but also how do we tackle corruption or how do we um, think about opportunities in conflict and post-conflict opportunities. Increasingly now we're thinking about, for example, issues such as climate adaptation. But in each case we're trying to think about what is that portfolio of rigorous evidence generation that we can invest in, that we can then try and use, but that also that, that others, can, others can use. Um, but we've also tried to think about how do we invest in the ecosystem. And so in some areas we've been trying to think about how do we grow new fields. So I think about the violence field or the education evaluation field. We've gone from actually there aren't that many academics or partners working in this. Let's get money out there and try and incentivize a few more to come on board. So, so for us, we're also sort of interested in can we make that ecosystem work ultimately. Um, you know, we're really proud to have supported JPAL in many different ways over the years. Um, and for us, that's part of building the ecosystem and um, you know, I'm really hugely impressed by how much has been achieved and how it's grown and like others congratulate you on the 20 years. But we've also, for example, invested in Dime um, because for us, we want the bank, we're a major supporter and a partner uh, with the bank, we want the bank to, to use their resources well, so why not support Dime to do that evaluation and then has that that return, for example, or 3IE or others as well. So just to say, we, in our sort of thinking, are constantly thinking about what is the ecosystem that can grow. Increasingly, we're getting interested in how do we really get meaningful Southern participation in that? How do you build capacity? How do we ensure that you're getting those centers of expertise or strength and capacity of universities across different continents to lead evaluations as well as be partners on evaluation. And if I look forward, that is for us a really important agenda moving forward is that we're taking that element of evidence generation um, 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 seriously. Um, but um, so, so just to say, we, we, I think we have been a, a long-term supporter. Personally, just to tell you my story, actually I wasn't that, that big on trials. Um, for a long time, I was a, a sort of person who did lots of survey work before coming into government. And my mind was changed when we did our first trial on violence against women. And actually, in that case, we didn't have a big audience saying, I need to know how to prevent violence, because they thought it was too hard. Um, yet all the, all the rhetoric in the UN and all the rhetoric in many countries was saying we need to prevent violence, we need to empower women. Um, we need to both economically and socially. So in that case, we were, you know, myself a, as a professor at London School of Hygiene and colleagues just said, well, everybody's talking about it, but nobody's doing it, let's try. 
Um, and then two years later, three years later, we showed that we um, reduced women's experience of violence in rural South Africa by 55% by using over two years by just a 10 session program added onto a microfinance basis. And so just to say, sometimes when you're trying to think about how to use trials, you need a bit of a boldness and go, actually, nobody's asking about this, but they should be. I'm gonna, we're gonna stick a neck out, try. I mean, I'm, it resonates with your presentation, actually. And then after that, it's become a field that's grown massively and, you know, and, and politically people are saying this is something we can impact on program uh, programmatic timeframes. So anyway, so, so you know, we, are, we are very, very keen on and using evidence. In terms of how we can do better, I think for me there's issues of how do we get better in terms of best practice, in terms of design. So I'm not an economist. I'm a, I come from public health, so I'm in a different trial community from health that has different sets of rules and regulations and approaches that's come out of doing pharma trials but increasingly extended to social interventions. So I think there's quite an opportunity to learn lessons and approaches. I think there's good on both sides, but there's some really marked differences. I also think we've been talking about RCTs and trials, but actually in the conversations, actually you've got a journey from that design and how does evidence inform a design of an intervention to piloting to actually doing a trial to then thinking about scale up. And I think it will be useful as we think about the future ahead to start articulating those different elements because the types of research you might do around scale, achieving scale, is different than might clearly than what you would do at a pilot. I think the third point for me looking forward is just how do we bring in a breadth of disciplines? It can be quite attractive to do a, a tidy, pared-down trial at low unit cost. But actually, if you have a flat result, you're left with, well, why? And if you don't have the qualitative insights, you might never know. And a whole promising body of intervention might be whitewashed, might be dismissed, because actually you couldn't answer the why, for example. Or similarly with economic ev evaluations. When I took the finding of our trial in South Africa to a conversation with the, the ministers, they said, well, how much does it cost? Right, that was the basic question. What are the type of unit cost inputs? So that I can think of what it means in budgetary terms. But I still, when I look across the breadth of trials, um, there aren't that many that are doing evalu e economic evaluations, at least from a provider spec perspective. So um, that's a few sort of initial thoughts on areas that I think we should um, think about a bit further moving forward, but I'm sure we can dig into that in a minute as well. Thank you so much. Thomas? Merci beaucoup, Esther, d'abord de m'avoir invité. Donc, je représente aujourd'hui l'Agence française de développement, qui est votre agence. Donc, n'hésitez pas à nous poser des questions. Nous sommes un certain nombre de collègues dans la salle. Um, maybe, Esther, yesterday night, you told the story about the last 20 years. And I'd like to tell sort of a similar story, but from a different position. So maybe how the, the story starts. But initially, I was more interested in, in, more interested in macroeconomics, but nothing against uh, micro. And uh, I happened to read actually a paper that w whose title was something like uh, Dev Experimenting in Development Economics, a Toolkit. Also. Uh, and I, I should see uh, Rachel <laughs> and, and Michael uh, smile, because they were the co-author of that paper, which I recommend, by the way, uh, which more or less described uh, RCT but also regression discontinuity designs, uh, diff and diff, uh, probably IVs, I'm not exactly sure exactly, but uh, uh, gave really an indication of uh, the various techniques to estimate or to, to measure or to make sure that causality uh, could be proved. Uh, so it sort of, I thought about this, but uh, uh, immediately uh, optimization under constraint came back to, to the real life. Uh, AFD funds between 500 and 1,000 projects per year, so it's absolutely not possible to fund 500 RCTs per year. If I were to uh, go to my CEO and ask him for the funding to do that, probably he would smile and tell me, oh, you are a funny guy, Thomas. I like you. Go back to work. Uh, because you have certainly need to be more selective uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and and the reason, well, partly for cost reasons, partly because there wouldn't be the people to do that, but also because uh, we need to take serious time to think about the questions that we want to answer. So at the time, Esther, of course you remember that, uh, microcredit was extremely fashionable, but probably uh, with unreasonable expectations. Uh, 
We partly guessed it was unreasonable because we knew the interest rates in microcredit were actually quite high. So uh, when you make loans at 15, 20, 25 percent interest rates, uh, the number of projects you'll be able to finance will be limited at the end of the day, and distribution costs will be will be heavy. But still. Fashion, I mean, it was very fashionable, and we need stronger evidence, not necessarily on a country-by-country -country basis, but more strategically. And, and for us, research was very important. Actually, not mostly, maybe I'm, I'm say, saying that to be provocative, but not, not mostly to know the efficiency of a particular project, but to design our, our strategies overall. Uh, because we're going to maybe have 20, 25, 50, 100 projects in microfinance, uh, but we don't actually need 100 evaluations to do that. We need to selectively isolate various contexts uh, where we can rigorously demonstrate impact and then draw reasonable wider conclusions based on a repetition of facts or a causality mechanism which would have been uh, able to identify. And amongst the serious questions that we have been uh, confronted with over the years, so microcredit was, was one, uh, we've had, we have seen also uh, growing concern about the quality of health and education services. If you remember at the time, the Millennium Development Ga Goals pleaded for widespread access to education and health, but we, we saw uh, in particular skills uh, unrelated to investments and hence the, the need to improve the return to that investment. And uh, the number of evaluation that were run, whether quantitative or qualitative, in education and health were massively important to help us design our strategy, in particular for education and health, and make sure that we don't invest too widely with very poor outcomes. Uh, just a few other exa examples, but uh, we were also uh, um, heavily criticized at AFD for our support to forestry management, as opposed to pure conservationism uh, in tropical forests, uh, and hence the need to compare zones in which there were sustainable forestry management plans to other zones. So here, in that case, it'd be matching rather than RCT, but uh, again, it's sort of a spillover of the literature on RCT to expand the quest for causality to other sectors, in particular infrastructure agriculture, uh, water sanitation, for example. So uh, apart from where the, this research came from, it also had massive uh, interest in other fields of the agency. Just a simple idea to run a baseline and an headline uh, probably wasn't a, a best practice or maybe not even dominant practice uh, at the time, but it's also sort of a positive spillover of the research agenda. Uh, also considering that uh, Ariana uh, alluded to it, but uh, we, AFD is not alone in its system. We are a number of other development banks or agencies. So, uh, and I think we've done that, but only to a certain extent. Uh, we can also rely on research done by others. So not each of us has to do uh, a fully coherent work as long as we can rely and, and observe cl closely what the others are doing. And again, it's not spontaneous in this, uh, uh, in this community because probably we have our own incentive to do the job by ourselves. Uh, but I would again please so that uh, we develop a um, sort of a community of, of research uh, and expand knowledge and maybe try to limit uh, the cases where we do the same things in the, in the same places. Uh, one of the challenges also is that research, if you look at the map of where research is happening worldwide, it's highly concentrated in a number of countries. So uh, thanks to Jepal and others, we've seen the literature grow in, uh, in India, probably have many papers in, on South Africa, Kenya, but uh, other countries maybe with different contexts so that external validity will be a problem. If you run an experiment, uh, let's say in India, probably it's not valid uh, as such in Ghana or in Senegal. So uh, diversifying uh, literature and, and research, I think is important. And that's related to the first point I made on uh, how do you uh, basically have a convincing story to say that you extrapolate from one particular experiment uh, to make the results relevant in other contexts. And diversifying the regions in which you can run research certainly helps that. And I think it has moved forward and now we're in a better position. Maybe just as a, as a conclusion, uh, to say that, uh, well, uh, Juliette already told, told the end of the story, so this, which is why I was coming back to the, the start of the story, but. Uh, as you know, we now host uh, uh, FID, um, and we are struck recently, we were doing a portfolio review with Juliette and others, um, and it, there are may actually many ways through which innovation can um, um, move and inspire public policies. 
We had firstly in mind, uh, and you've seen the various steps that FID is able to finance, that probably some projects would go from step one to step two to step three to step four. Uh, and wh what we actually, uh, and at my surprise, uh, are beginning to observe is that actually some project might move from step one to step three, or, or, or probably from step two directly to public policies. Uh, may maybe if you're not familiar with these steps, I'm just coming back a little. Uh, what we observe, that's my interpretation of the previous presentation you had uh, uh, with uh, Krabina and uh, Alison on Ghana, uh, where you have research embedded in national processes which I think is hugely important. Uh, the dominant fact maybe uh, 20 or 30 years ago was that there was research on the one hand and uh, public policy on the, other, on the other hand. And certainly uh, we see our role as AFD as trying to build bridges between the two of them. That's probably how, why, uh, why and how we met uh, with JEPAL. It's because we, I think uh, uh, Abhijit said earlier that many conclusion of, of papers is uh, there's a shortage of uh, political, uh, political will. It, we, we've, we've read that too many times now, <laughs> and we need to seriously work on why is it, is it that so, so much research ends, ends up with, oh, maybe we are not being listened to by politicians. And one way to solve that is actually from the start to identify questions and processes through which research can be directly connected to policy making. I'm not saying it's the same thing, it's two, it's two different jobs, but it's not to separate jobs. That, that's, I think, a very important message. And the thing we want to do through our research, and I guess it's the same for, for FID, uh, is also to, to accompany governments to develop evaluation structure, research structure, not that they're going to work 100% uh, by themselves. They probably are interested in, interna in international partnerships, but it's not the same as being entirely separated. And I think it's something that's very uh, interesting that has come up in the process. Maybe one, one last message has been said before, but uh, uh, climate change is a very important uh, new uh, challenge, um, uh, both for macro and micro. And personally, I expect, uh, and I'm a lot of expectations on uh, micro research, in particular experimentation, to design better micro foundations for macro model relating climate change and, uh, and growth in general. Uh, we know that agriculture will be massively impacted by, by climate change, but how exactly can we reduce the impact of climate change uh, on, uh, on agriculture, I think will be a major question for tomorrow. And so far, the micro foundations for our macro work is too limited. So uh, if I just uh, formulate a request, I'd say to work more on, on that and probably also the role of AI in development. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so my daughter was, is in college, and I don't know exactly what was going on, but she turned to her friend who was complaining about something and said, life is full of trade-offs. And her friend said, wow, it must have been horrible growing up with an economist father. <laughs> um, but in a, in a simple way, that's, you know, I think the heart of what this movement has brought to the conversation is to make salient those trade-offs and bring some data to them to help, help guide some otherwise tough decisions. Because um, it's really easy to get excited by a lot of the things that everybody's doing in development. It's, you know, there's a lot of need, there's a lot of problems, uh, there's a lot of, um, it, it, you know, a lot of ideas that sound great. And ultimately, the space, although, it, you know, it's obviously grounded in a particular approach to doing that is fundamentally just trying to help that world make better choices and focus. Okay, so I was going to leave, I, was, I have three thoughts I want to share, and two, two of those are apologies. Um, the, the first is, I think the largest impact that we've had in the space as a movement, and that hopefully, and I see some nice changes happening further along these lines as well, is a cultu this cultural change. Um, it's not any one study, um, it's not any one thing, the thing, um, any one, one result, but it is the cultural change of using data to focus in this way and then have this kind of be dialed in on understanding about causality and, 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 and this, these, these approaches to evaluation, but that it transcends beyond that too. It's not just about the RCTs, it's also about using RCTs to filter down some choices and then having some sharp ideas about what other data outside of the RCT is needed in order to know 
is this something we should do over here or not? Right? How do we know? Right? It, sometimes the answer is do another RCT, but that's not a great world to be in if the answer is always do another one. There needs to, you know, and that is, but having the RCTs gives us the base to say, well, what were the necessary contextual factors? Do they exist over here? What data do we need to validate our theory to know that over here, we don't, we don't need to do another RCT, we have some of the basic facts. You know, what's the, you know, if it's a school intervention, what are the baseline, what, what are the literacy rates? Are teachers there? What is the student-teacher ratio? These are all contextual factors that, that some of them might be institutional that you need to know. None of that comes from an RCT, but you need that combined with the RCT evidence to make those tough choices. And so I think, you know, the biggest, the biggest impact has been on this culture, and in some sense, it's always left me on a personal level feeling a little bit weird. As a professor, you know, we get asked a lot, I'm sure the those in the room who are professors are accustomed to this too, you get asked questions as if we're supposed to have the answers. I, I didn't choose this job because I had answers. I choose, chose this job because I had questions. If I wanted to choose a job because I had answers, I would have worked in human rights. That's, that's the area I've always felt more passionate in. My favorite classes in college were political philosophy, not economics. <clears throat> and so, um, but you know, we, are, we are all doing this, in the, this kind of work because we actually don't know the answers to things. And we just, we, what we do feel strongly about is this is a process for figuring that out and let's, and let's mark down that path. Um, but it is always a little bit weird to feel like you're in a job and you're succeeding because of your ignorance. Um, but that is basically <laughs> what it comes down to. Um, or being willing to admit that ignorance, I would say. One of the, one of the, the, the last group, too, it was very striking and I was very impressed by, the, by the, um, the, the willingness and eagerness to put it on the line. The strong, uh, not strong, I'm sorry, what was the, um, yeah, what was it? Lively minds, thank you. I knew I had the wrong adjective. Right? That's that's really impressive, and that is um, and is that kind of leadership and 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 focus that has been absolutely necessary. We we dorky academics would never have gotten there if it weren't for practitioners willing to willing to question and willing to say, hey, I need to find out because if it's not working, let's find a better way, and maybe it's not this. Um, so. Um, but this, this, this culture of asking and culture of willing to be ignorant is, is actually critical and it extends well beyond just what star CTs. Um, and so this, the second thing I want, want to say is, you know, it's in the spirit of the no one study is the, is the panacea, no one intervention is the panacea, the, what's really exciting that we're starting to see happening is the you know, the wealth of randomized trials that have been done, some of them very, very similar. You spoke about microcredit. Um, those weren't planned to be similar, they just turned out to be similar. Um, there's others that have been planned to be similar in, in various levels of similarity. There's tremendous more that we can learn from doing work that just sits back and kind of goes back to our, you know, download data as an academic sitting in the ivory tower space. And, and, and using the infrastructure that has been built with JPAL, IPA, and others to produce you know, over 4,000 now RCTs, and it's actually quite exciting. Um, one of the, so here's one of the apologies that comes from, as an economist, that we have learned from the wealth of that, that information. In principles of economics, we teach systematically, nice little chart that says, labor and leisure, you have a trade-off, we do trade-offs. And as you get more money, you choose more leisure. Right? This is taught in so many principles of economics courses. And it has led to so many um, bad conversations. We never say, but there's also other factors too um, that push the other way. Just empowering people. They, they, they're capital constrained. They give, need money. With that money, they can work more. It might be uplifting. It might solve some stress and some conflicts on a personal level that allow them to then have that focus to invest more. Um, empirically, we've now seen from enough randomized trials on cash transfers to know that that principles of economics lesson was just flat wrong in developing countries. And we have a nice, tight, zero or sometimes positive impact on, on labor supply. Um, 
So, but we didn't get there from one study, right? You wouldn't take one study and do that. We get there from being able to see that over and over again, you have that kind of systematic result. Um, so the second, and well, the second apology, the third thought, <laughs> comes to um, a bit on this question of, um, there's two different conversations that I think that I've here spoken about today, and they're actually very different. Um, one is about cost-benefit analysis, about trying to make the case overall for a sector and the value it is providing. The other just says, we have a problem, we have a goal, how do we move the needle on that goal as much as we can? So our goal is reducing domestic violence, our goal is improving income, our goal is improving test scores, it might be democracy, it might be easier to measure consumption, it might be harder to measure, it doesn't matter. One thing that I have found at USAID is that conversations on the first are like make me an enemy. People that just turns people off to economists because it's like we're sitting there telling them that you know how much money is it worth to reduce a case of domestic violence in order to then convert that to decide whether to spend money on domestic violence or increasing income, or improving a farmer yield, or improving a test score. So everything has to get converted to dollars. So the philosopher in me actually finds that a little interesting, but the, pra but the pragmatist in me realizes that this is doing harm to the conversation that I prefer to have, which is to say, what's your goal? How do we move the needle on that goal as much as we can? There's a broader conversation that is political in an ideal world is, philosophy, you know, is about philosophy of values across sectors, but we can do so much more good by just taking the exact outcome that we care about, taking the pot of money that's at stake and saying, how do we move the needle on that more? And some of that is about choosing better activities and just recognizing that this program is better than some other program at moving the needle. Some of it is about how to operate. It goes back to Esther's plumber's paper, for those familiar with this, or plumber's, was it a paper or a speech? Both, okay. <laughs> um, and just figuring out like, no, we're gonna do this, and, but there's four different ways of doing it, and let's get inside the weeds of how it's actually done, recognizing that there's some big decisions to made that can move the needle there. So that's, um, that, and, for, and for what it's worth, this is a very big focus we've been taking at USAID in the way we're trying to operate and trying to move the needle. And most of that comes down to you know, winning friends, basically, by, by gathering support for a common, a common activity that everybody agrees this is a good activity and there's strong evidence that it can move the needle. And now, when you want to talk about whether to do something extra, because, because basically you do have, in, in most, most kind of context, it's easy when you know, everybody's at the table and has an idea and everybody gets their idea into, the, into a program, but if everybody agrees that, wait, some core activity, whether it's a cash transfer, whether it's a very basic training program, that that, that works. Now, everything else that you do comes at the trade-off of that core thing. Right? And that's a much easier conversation to have when everybody agrees that we like this core thing, because now you're not telling them that their idea is not good, you're actually telling them you, they have two ideas, and now you just you have to choose. So which, you, you agreed you like this one, and if you do the second one, you give up the first. Which one do you want? And what's the evidence? And when the evidence lacks, then, you, then you know, that's a moment where you maybe want to go get more evidence, or, but if the evidence is there, then obviously choose the better one. Um, those are my thoughts. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I realize that we are standing between people and that we are going to keep to a uh, uh, few minutes of, of conversation. So I think I'll try with just one question that I would like each of you to, to address in about in a couple of minutes, but it's a small, small question, so that should be fine. Uh, Hervé Berville, the minister, spoke about the, the, the crisis of legitimacy of uh, uh, the whole enterprise of ODA. And I think that the summit that uh, is happening, uh, the uh, NFP summit uh, that's happening uh, yesterday and today, uh, kind of speaks to that uh, unease that there is. 
uh, part of the unease may be coming from what Ariana mentioned about kind of the whole project of telling people what they should do, even if it's to help them, uh, even, even if it's to help them financially doing it, is seen with uh, uh, more and more suspicion. So, in, in, uh, I must admit my one apology is that I've been long somewhat impatient with the uh, question of whether aid works or it doesn't work, because it's like, well, whatever, it's so small with respect to the amount of money that's being spent by the poor in the world that whether it works or doesn't work is kind of irrelevant in comparison to the money that is available in the developing countries. The entire money should be spent the best way possible to achieve those objectives. And I fully agree that those objectives are political, object, like should be politically decided by the political process. And the rest is you know, doing it as best as we can. In this context, uh, if instead of sitting here, you were standing, sitting at the table uh, in, in Palibronier and telling, and you know, the new president of the World Bank is coming, the ears are open to how to radically change the infrastructure of your business, what would you do on the basis of that to kind of change the model in a way that serves that purpose? Uh, and uh, also make sure that whatever money is available is being leveraged in the best way possible to this objective. Uh, maybe we can go in the same order we, we, we went and uh, keep, uh, you know, about a, a minute for this small, small cost. <laughs> well, that's a tough question. But, so I... I kind of think that there are some things we're really good at and some things we're not very good at. Uh, so what we're, I think we got pretty good at is the evidence to action link locally. You know, working with agencies and making sure that we can work with them organically and iteratively to improve what they're doing, to help them improve what they're doing. Um, at the portfolio level, at the big numbers level, we are not very good at this. Uh, there is a lot of political economy that enters who does what kind of spending for what kind of purpose. And there are entrenched interests. Within an institution like the World Bank, different groups doing different type of projects. Uh, at the level of the UN, different agencies doing different type of interventions. Kind of moving that needle is actually quite difficult, even within an institution like the World Bank, even when we have very precise measures at portfolio level that something delivers zero and something delivers 20% reductions in poverty. There is a process, but it's a slow process. And so one question is, you know, how do we elevate the issue of portfolio choices for the big numbers that matter quite a bit? So poverty reduction is very much you know, front and center when we have programs that reach about 100 million people, but we need to reach 700 million people. And there is money out there being spent on things that are not very effective. So I think that's, that's an important question, and it, it, it does require leadership and a change in the way we allocate funds at that level. In terms of development finance, as you say, Esther, this is very tiny. It's very tiny relative to domestic resources, but it's extraordinarily tiny relative to the stock market and, in, and private sector investment. We are talking about many zeros of difference. So the question is, what do we do with development finance? And I probably was heard saying these things 20 years ago, but today there is a real opportunity for actually acting on this, which is that we should use all of development finance, all of ODA, for learning purposes. Why? Because we can use that little amount of money to enter in a country dialogue in a, with all the stakeholders, with all the ministries, all the NGOs, and all the, all the different uh, donors and development partners, and have a conversation about what do we want to learn programmatically and iteratively to move the agenda. And that's a way of leveraging everybody's strength the research strength of JPA, the World Bank, and others, and IPA, the strength of ministries and contextual knowledge, and so forth and so on. So I, I would say there are ways of moving this agenda, um, but we need to 
kind of act on it as, with one voice and be much more forceful in the use of development finance for learning and advancing progress. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to answer it. Ooh, yes. Um, I'm going to answer it um, based on that, that first element that the minister referred to about that in a way the, the sort of public concern around development finance. So you're right, at one level it's small in the scale of the resources needed, but if you're a, you know, a country which is committing substantial money to development, maintaining that public support is critical. Um, and for me, I do think there are a couple of elements that I think we should be getting better at. One is really talking in a more nuanced way about what is the difference that the investments make. And, and there, actually, that generation of evidence, that supporting of innovation, um, is a, that, that long-term partnerships to support fundamentally good policy making by countries for their own populations is the story we need to tell. And I don't think we tell that story sufficiently. Um, and clearly, as part of that, that the ways in which our money adds value, but actually it's partnership. Um, I think, I mean, clearly, when you're thinking about development, there's other elements around expertise. So for me, if I'm thinking about external actors, it's what is the role of external actors to not only, it, it, you know, when, we, when we're thinking about the vision of development, it's really not about the money. It's really about all of the other elements as well. And again, we tend to get focused on it's, it's the percentage. You know, we've gone from 0.7 to 0.5. The communities engage with are clearly saying you've got less money, but but from our internal discussions, what we are saying is yes. But what are the other things we want to bring to bear? How we how do we use our political capital? How do we use and, and try and support expertise? How do we invest in that evidence that can be used? How do we synthesise it in ways that you can take it into high-level bilateral or multilateral conversations? That actually is the way I think we will really have impact and it's the story i would like us to be telling to to the populations that do care about development that that there's a lot to this and a lot we can do i'm, I'm really building on this investments around evidence and that the depth of expertise i think we now have and opportunities around innovation um to tackle fundamentally the issues everybody is scared about like climate pandemics and so on Um, Esther, you used the word leverage, and I think it's very important. Just to give you an example, uh, AFD is managing roughly 1 billion euros a year in the name of the government and 11 billion in loans. So if you just take the grant part, for example, uh, let's say if we were to spend equally that money in India, it would be less than a dollar per inhabitant. Same for Africa. So it's absolutely not true. And we should really, really remove that idea of our minds that uh, ODA or development finance is about transferring massive capital from developed to developing countries. It's absolutely, I mean, the numbers absolutely do not match. So it means we have, be, it means we have to be extremely efficient, efficient sorry, uh, with, the, with the money we have. Part is purely financial leverage, so AFD borrow on the market to, to lend money to other developing countries. That's useful for them. They get better rates. It's one way to get leverage. Uh, currently, it's being discussed in Paris how we can leverage on private money, so that's uh, another avenue. Uh, but really bringing ideas into the debate, into public policies, is also one way through which one euro invested uh, or one dollar invested can get more massive impact. But again, uh, should we move from our minds that uh, ODA is a massive uh, capital transfer public policy? Maybe it's been true in the 60s, but absolutely not the case right now. So, uh, and by leverage, probably there are, there are more meaning than just one uh, avenue. But what we've been discussing since, since yesterday, I think, is one way to, to increase value for money. And, and most money is actually money. Uh, it's taxpayers' money in developing countries. It's savings in developing countries. That's basically where most most of the financing is going to come from, and what we can do is, uh, but you said it earlier, Esther, and I strongly agree with that, is that by bringing innovation or, or ideas probably is one way to leverage not only in international resources, but mostly actually on domestic and national resources within developing countries. Thank you. You have the last one.
people will eat you if it's too long. Sure. Um, so I have one broad answer and one more, one more narrow. Um, the, the broad answer is, you know, we're, I mean, I couldn't agree more. We're tiny, <laughs> you know, each, and particularly when we look at each agency. I'm often struck by conversations I find myself in where people are putting forward, like, GDP numbers as goals and, and then, you know, plans for things to do to promote economic growth, you know, but with a budget that's like, no, like you're not gonna, like first of all, we'll never know, <laughs> but even if, even if your goal is to, you know, move up GDP growth in a country, um, you know, a budget of 50 million in aid money is not gonna do that, but it can actually make a huge difference. Right? There's things you can do that are, that are effective, but like when we start thinking at large, but the government can, government policy does matter. And so this gets at the, the heart of you know, what we're seeing happen more of and is really exciting, which is when the aid and the research, I say this as both a researcher and you, know, you could make the same argument without, without research, but the, with, as just aid money becomes pilots, becomes innovation labs, the embedded labs, the innovation funds, things that we're talking, that, that we've heard about here, are great examples of this because they're long-term partnerships with the government, helping the government learn. Yes, using aid money to do that process of both learning and paying for pilots, but but the on-ramp there to then see the successful things scale right into government policy. That's the goal. That's that's now you know where we can hopefully see scale. And then the real hope, and this is you know, the, the job of, of World Bank and other multilaterals, USAID has this aspiration as well, of creating a global public good where the one country can learn from the next country and on. And so it's not, it's not just um, being done for any one place. Um, the, so that's the, that's the broad thought. The more narrow thought is on, on climate, in particular some of the you know, obviously this is very much at the forefront of our mind when someone says global public good, they often are talking about climate. Um, I do think of knowledge as a global public good as well. Um, with climate, you know, the, the striking thing to me from at least what I'm observing is, you know, two very different conversations. One is on mitigation and, and one is on adaptation. And the, you know, the mitigation com conversation has, you know, all sorts of exciting things that I hear about, but you know, Hope, and I'm an optimist, I hope, <laughs> I think. So I'm hoping that you know, some, some engineering and things of this nature, things will like, pleasantly surprise us in years to come. The adaptation is, what, is where you know, a lot of my mind goes because I'm not an you know, environmental scientist. And on an adaptation, the striking thing to me is, well, there are some cases of, of us, um, when we talk about adaptation and kind of the global Con the global issues because of climate change, a lot of, a lot of times it's forgetting that the single best way of helping, a, you know, what is a poor person really facing when it comes to climate change? They're facing, I say that, they're facing, they're facing risks from variation and, and rainfall and things of this nature, right? The single best way to help someone adapt to shocks is to make them richer, that's it, right? Sure, there's some other things and there might be some technologies, different crops, but like the single best thing to do is to help them be richer. And that's actually the same goal we had if climate change wasn't an issue. So there's a lot of aspects where adaptation is not actually changing what we really need to focus on, which is just how to make households wealthier so they can absorb shocks better. Um, and that includes being healthier, being more educated, being able to migrate. Um, these are all parts, parts of, of that. Thank you. Thank you to each of you for a very stimulating panel. Uh, thank you and disclosure that uh, the growth of JPAL owes a lot, uh, not only as a matter of culture, but uh, as a matter of gold cash uh, to all of you uh, as a representative of your institution, of course. Uh, you have been a big uh, champion of, of this movement, uh, both intellectually and financially, and I should acknowledge it. <laughs> and uh, now we'll conclude this session. Uh, I will send you uh, to lunch, and please come back by 2.15. Uh, Dean's intervention is a perfect segue to this afternoon. Our first session will be on climate. 
uh, and I, I hope that you uh, come back and bring your friends because that proves to be exciting. And in the afternoon, we'll talk about research, bringing back again people from the field who are actually uh, participating in those projects.